uh, just a few quick remarks about myself before we begin, because there's a lot of material and quite a lot of slides. So I'm a, some guy called conference tourist. I ride to different places around the world, mostly Europe, and visit Python conferences, usually talk uh, at them. I work as a Python developer at STX Next uh, Software House. This is the biggest Python software house in Europe. I run Python which meet up in central Poland, and I write blog under breadcrumbscollector.tech. So the, the title of today's, um, yeah, or the, today's topic is something related to software engineering. And this is a discipline uh, who actually cares how to write code so it's good in the future and how to improve it. So this is not a very popular topic in Python conferences or in Python community at, at all. Uh, of course, it's always nice to just do pip install and the magic package does the work for us, which not always is the case because of the complexity. So you know probably how complex code might look like. It's hard to change, hard to understand. Uh, it turns out, so the software engineering fights a fierce battle with complexity from its beginning. And it turns out that actually there are two different types of complexity. One of them is accidental, and the second one is essential. And these are very distinct, different creatures. Accidental, accidental complexity is something that you can either evade or improve. Hey, this function is too big. Let's split it into two smaller ones so it will be simpler. Uh, or maybe just use another language because, for example, Python is much better to express such an idea than Java or C++, for example. Uh, but the essential complexity is a very different creature because this is something you actually cannot avoid. If your boss comes to you or anyone else and tell, tells you implement me 50 features, then your software will be complex no matter which language you will choose to implement it. And this distinction is actually comes from the No Silver Bullet paper published in 1996. So this is just as old as the software engineering itself. So the clean architecture uh, is there to manage this essential complexity. One of the way how to prove it, and this will be focusing on web application, but that's much broader application also. So it promises you so you'll be independent on frameworks, uh, not to mention that you will not need them, but if you upgrade or want to switch, it's not that painful. Uh, you will, can write tests very easily, and they will test what's important and not the framework. And you will somehow independent of UI, database, or whatever, any other. So the goal of clean architecture is to separate complexity of your code, of your business requirements, from the complexities of the outside, like what, uh, just like frameworks and so on. So I won't be talking in void, just giving you dry facts. This will be a real example, uh, an auctions online service, a web application. So. We can describe requirements of business in terms of user stories, for example. These are short sentences that more or less explain what the user can do with the application. So first of all, as a bidder, I would like to make a bid so I can win the auction. Uh, as a bidder, I want to be notified by email if my offer is the winning one. And as an admin administrator, I want to be able to withdraw a bit, maybe because I'm asked to or I detect some malicious behavior and I also want this bit to be gone. So if we were to choose a Django REST framework and program it in idiomatically as this framework assumes, then we would start off with models. As a, so we would just take these user stories, search for any, uh, any verbs, and uh, nouns, sorry, and then we would just turn them into models. So this is the classic approach. And I would like to focus on the third one. So as an admi administrator, I want to be able to withdraw a bit. So one of the coolest features of Django is that it has this admin panel, which literally saves you hours of work. So to get this nicely looking um, interface, we just need literally six lines of codes. And that's all when you have these are uh, invisible checkboxes when you can check which bits you, bits you want to withdraw and just click save, boom, it's gone. Except it's not that easy because we need to notify users if they actually are now new winners. So this is not just the simple action that we can just delete rows from a database and cool, we find. No, the business requirements are a bit complicated. And of course, 
now we are left with ourselves. But luckily, Django has this notion of um, putting your hooks in many different situations so you can uh, customize this operation. So there is a safe related method which you can write your custom code. And please don't read the code. I will be uh, just uh, describing what highlighted areas do. So first of all, we just parse the, uh, which checkbox were checked and uh, selecting uh, bits from the database. Uh, then we are using a method withdraw bits on the auction because, uh, for example, we have a winner and we withdraw this bid because it's inappropriate or something like that. And the current price of the auction changes. So I cannot just delete a bit without affecting the auction. So this, this is the whole point. And in the end, I notify new winners if there are some. Um, so if we look at this from a different analytical perspective, uh, we have a situation like this. There is an actor, meaning the type of user or person who interacts with the system, and this is an administrator. We have a boundary of the system, meaning an interface which the actor uses to interact with the system, which is admin panel, which is shipped by Django. And there is a use case a business scenario when system is used, which is, in this case, withdrawing a bit. And in this code, these two are melted together. You cannot tell where is the boundary actually between the framework and your logic. So to separate it, because these are quite the different things and they will change for different reasons, uh, a standard refactoring movement would be to just pull it to some class, to some function, and place it somewhere aside. And this function does actually the same what the code in the previous slide did, except it just accepts some parameters to not be too coupled with the admin panel code. And this is the first building block of the clean architecture. This is called either use case or interactor. Whichever suits you best, I tend to use use case because it's just more concise and takes less letters. Uh, so if I were to think uh, what a use case is, I would imagine this is like a conductor who orchestrates entire processes and tells exactly what the process, the business process should look like. What should happen next? So let's talk about tests for a second. Um, if we write code in such a way that it is coupled with web framework or any other tools we use, so will be our tests. We cannot just test our logic we try to implement without talking to framework. And such a test, a common idiom I'm seeing over and over again in Django applications is that we test our logic using views. And the structure of such a test is actually pretty familiar, I assume. And it has three stages. At first, stage one, we set the stage, meaning we insert some objects to database or using some fixtures to uh, prepare the, the scenario under test. Then we issue some um, query to get the uh, response. And eventually, we assess if the uh, response is as we expected. So this is called free AA, uh, arrange, uh, act, assert. And this. Uh, is the common idiom, but it has a very, very nasty uh, downside. <laughs> so it's super slow. And so super slow because for the majority of the time, you are not testing your code you, written, you have written. You are testing the framework, which you probably assume it's working anyway because you have chosen it. Um, so if we look for a textbook example how it looked like, so we will probably see the as simple as useless calculator example. When you have this add function, and you check if the result is as you expected. So as simple as that, but it looks very differently from what we are uh, dealing with in real life. Um, but there is a reason why people use uh, such an example when they are teaching about uh, unit tests. Because uh, this function has a few distinctive features that make it so easy to test. And first of all, it has no external dependencies. Everything that is needed to produce a result is given in the arguments. And the second thing, 
It has no side effects. It doesn't connect to a database, doesn't use a system clock, nothing. Uh, it's independent of the state of, of the universe and so on. In functional programming, this is called a pure function. And such pure functions are very easy to test. So the conclusion is that if your code has no side effects and no dependencies, they will be very easy to test. Of course, we cannot get rid of it because we actually want that code does something and the data has to get to the database in the end. But let's just control it and not let it uh, mingle with our logic. So the first thing when we want to get rid of dependencies is to find them. Uh, this is the same code from the uh, initial use case scenario. So for example, we are coupled with Django RM here because we are using it directly to fetch some objects and then uh, to do some operations on them. Um, so the typical uh, idea of software engineering how to hide something or how to solve a problem is usually to introduce another layer of abstraction. So just to hide it. So I will use such an abstraction. Just call it auctions repository. Can't really tell what it is. Can't really tell what it does. Except it has these two methods. One is get and one is save. And if I were to write it down as in class or maybe some abstract type because I still don't know what it is supposed to do exactly, it would be such an abstract class. So from the point of view use case or any other business uh, scenario, we are just using, we are thinking in terms of abstraction, looking like this. And that's actually the second building block of the clean architecture. This is called interface or port. Again, port is more concise. Uh, of course, every abstract class actually has uh, to have somewhere the concrete implementation because we want this code to get somewhere. Uh, so this is called interface adapter or simply adapter. And this is the third building block of the clean architecture. But the whole point, the whole trick is that when we want to use it in the use case, it must not know that it uses the concrete implementation. It must think, it must be convinced that this is still an abstraction. And since we have these uh, type annotations from Python 3.5, we can easily do it. Uh, when we declare the use case, we tell it, hey, this is, is abstraction. So it doesn't know if he's using the concrete implementation on the abstract class. And when constructing use case, we are just putting it there. Um, so this is, technique is called dependency injection. And of course, it would be very tedious and error prone to pass the requirements to dunder in it every time we need to create a class. So there are some nice libraries over there, which we can get using pip install. That will simplify the entire process. So there is this inject. And this actually works like a giant dictionary. Whenever we ask it, hey, give me auctions repo, which is abstract, it gives us a concrete implementation. So we don't have to worry about what's actually how it's configured. And there are other notions. So we no, no longer have to manually um, assign these uh, concrete implementations. So that's, that relieves us a bit. So what actually we gained from the another layer uh, uh, except from complicating the thing. So first it's a bit easier to reason about logic of the use case because we uh, got out of sight some logic there. Uh, we can now write true unit tests because we can easily uh, substitute this using mocks. We don't have to write some crazy patches uh, because this is just an, as easy as invoking inject configure. And the work under one task can be paralyzed. And this is a um, real life scenario when I was working on a project very similar to that with my uh, colleague Dominika. So we first had a short session about uh, half an hour uh, of pair programming when we wrote just a rough sketch of the use case. Then she continued to working on that while I started to working on implementation of the repository. So actually we can work faster. And the most killer feature for me 
uh, is that decision making can be delayed. So for example, with uh, ORM and saving, it doesn't make much sense, but if we uh, don't know yet which will be the payment provider, for example, or which database we, we're using, this can be somehow delayed a bit and we can just move on with the business logic without having to commit to such a decision in the beginning when we know the less, the least of the project. But wait a second. I lied to you because there's still one thing out there that's untouched. And this is, we are still relying on Django ORM to do our logic. So I will have just logic implemented in ORM, which is not what I wanted. So here comes the final building block of the clean architecture, which is the entity. And the entity is, uh, it might be a class, it might be a bunch of functions. Uh, the history represents so-called enterprise-wide logic, and this uh, sounds like a Harry Potter spell, but actually uh, this is to encapsulate some business rules that have to remain true no matter of the context of the usage. So for example, uh, I have this auction, okay, and it will have uh, some uh, property which is not visible here like current price. So current price will be the best bit at the time. And whenever I, for example, withdraw a bit, so in this example of admin panel, or maybe I make a bit using some different interface, then the current price will be affected. Okay, so it means that I cannot just reason without, reason about auction without its bits, and so on. So this class is just for it, so I can contain all the code related to it, logic, because these are two different contexts and two different actors would interact in one class. And of course, the, in this case, when this is a pure Python class, which would be, by the way, very easy, simple to test, uh, then we no longer rely on Django RM to fetch our entities. So we have to write the code in update our adapter that will just be translating Django RM models to these simple classes. And these are more or less it uh, from the building blocks, except there is also a presenter, but I uh, couldn't fit this into slides, so you can see the example project to see what's the role of it. Okay, and there's also space for more. Um, so this is a layered architecture, meaning that we start from the domain where entities are laying, and this depends on nothing. They know nothing about the outer world. Then there is an application which encompasses domain, and there are, uh, this is a place for use cases and interfaces. And there is a arrow. This is a very significant one. It means that on the application layer, I can import anything from the domain, but I cannot do it in the opposite direction. It's forbidden. And infrastructure is home for interface adapters. There may be some place for web frameworks also. And another and another layer. Um, so, uh, Final remarks, what to be careful of when using this approach. So forget about writing code according to tutorials. So you have to open your mind. Uh, you'll write more code, sometimes twice as much. Um, validation, uh, yeah, this has to be carefully uh, overthought before, because there is no simple room for, for example, checking if we are really getting a number and uh, not, an in, uh, not a string. And there's also a risk of over-engineering. Um, okay, uh, just to finish, because uh, I have still time for questions. Okay, so you might think that this is firing the heaviest gun, like from nightmares of Java programmers, something like that, at the mosquito. So, as always, it depends. So it depends what is your use case, what project are you making? Uh, so if you have lots of test cases to cover, uh, this is really, there are concepts you have to model and they are really so complex you just can't wrap your hand around it in a simple, in one meeting, then it may pay off. Uh, if you want or you have to delay some decision making, yeah, that's also a solution. We can introduce these abstractions. Or if you, you have just complicated domain when there are really so many complex uh, things to, to model then you just, you need just a special notion to deal with it. So this is from my side. Uh, under this QR code on the 
link, you will find the slides, a, a bit extended version of this talk. And thank you very much. So we still have time for questions. Yep. Do you have any like tips on converting an existing code base to like use some of these principles? Uh, okay, so I would start off from uh, just cutting out use cases first, and then introducing some uh, abstractions if you are really uh, committed to doing so. So first, use cases, and then if this is needed, then uh, interface and adapters. And uh, so the most controversial part, actually, is, is this one. Uh, because if we want to all these our business uh, objects to be pure Python classes, that means a lot of work because we are usually relying heavily on Django RM or SQL Alchemy. So we can skip this step. Because in Python, this involves a lot of work like this, like saying this translation. Uh, in Java or that on C Sharp, there is no such a problem because they have tools when you write such a class and these things are generated for you. So maybe this is, especially when we are dealing with legacy code bases, I wouldn't start from this. So, okay. Does it answer your question? Okay. Yep. Yeah, so the, uh, the truth is that it, this can be disadvantage, and I'm spending a lot of time on teaching other people what things look like, but in the Django, they uh, were all, all already proficient, so they understood it. The problem is that the projects we were making, uh, we couldn't fit this into Django. It just didn't, didn't fit at all. So meaning even if we were really religiously following Django's doctrine, it didn't end up well. So, so that's the reason. But if we were able to stick to it, yeah, this was, there, there would be no reason for searching like fancy solutions like this. Yep? I think uh, this is not a question, but just kind of a semi-response. There's a lot of middle ground between this and idiomatic Django, and it's possible to kind of take the best of both. Uh, at my company, we kind of like independently just came up with an approach that's actually quite similar to this. We just use different names for everything, like accessories and controllers. It's just different naming, but it's quite similar, where we have uh, something that encapsulates our interactions with the database and allows us to test them independently from the ORMs logic. But it, it's also, we still have like pretty idiomatic Django code that links into that encapsulation. And I don't think it's necessarily uh, all or nothing, one or the other. You can, you can make it familiar to Django codes while still getting some of the benefits of it. Yeah, I would, I would agree, especially with the statement, there is a lot of middle ground because there are also more elaborate, more complicated techniques that this is just the, really a child's play. This is tip of the iceberg. Uh, everything uh, depends on what works for you best. Yep. I, I work with a lot of scientific software developers and they're not trained in software engineering at all and any of this would be fantastic. How do you, how do you introduce Python programmers who are not trained in engineering to the, to the topic? What's the ramp up? Uh, okay, so um, I come from a quite a different uh, background because uh, mostly I deal with uh, web developers. And my, one of my responsibilities is to actually um, coach them. And so, for example, we have uh, these 360 polls every six months, and I, for example, sell people uh, a list of books so they can get acquainted to, to, to know better. Uh, also, a code review is a great, uh, great help to them because 
I can hey, look at this. You could just get rid of these few arguments from your function that will be simpler. So, but for, um, I don't know, for a broader, there's not really. We have some internal meetings in our company to, so we can talk about improving our code, but that's, that's actually it. It's more about direct influence. Okay. Okay. 